Greetings. I am Dr. Carl Mayer, the Editor-in-Chief of Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and I am pleased to welcome you to the multimedia summary for the journal's May 2021 issue. There are four articles, three of which focus on COVID-19, that have been selected as our Editor's Choice or Highlights articles this month. Our Editor's Choice this month is a special article on a paradigm and program for administering anti-spike monoclonal antibodies to eligible patients with COVID-19. And this article is entitled, A Framework for Outpatient Infusion of Anti-Spike Monoclonal Antibodies to High-Risk Patients with Mild to Moderate Coronavirus Disease 19, the Mayo Clinic Model. It is authored by Dr. Raymond Rasanoble from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and colleagues from Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, Florida, Arizona, and Wisconsin. Infection with SARS-CoV-2 leads to polymorphic clinical presentations that encompass a spectrum ranging from an entirely asymptomatic state to severe life-threatening illness. The former is managed by quarantine while the latter necessitates care in the intensive care unit with therapies that may include remdesivir and dexamethasone. For individuals with mild to moderate disease and concomitant risk factors for disease escalation and the need for hospitalization, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, via emergency use authorization, approved the use of several spike neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that may be intravenously administered in the outpatient setting. Such authorization for use by the FDA was based on encouraging data from early phase clinical trials demonstrating that the use of these antibodies as compared with placebo reduced viral load and the risk for disease progression. Rasanab et al. discuss in depth the development and current functioning of the outpatient program at Mayo Clinic that administers these antibodies to eligible high-risk patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. The article begins by detailing the challenges in developing such a program, and these include, among others, first, the need to establish facilities separate from existing outpatient infusion centers, such that non-infected patients receiving non-COVID-19 related therapy in these infusion centers are not exposed to patients with COVID-19 administered anti-spike monoclonal antibody. Second, the relative lack of awareness by patients and providers of the availability of such therapeutic options. And third, the fact that the use of neutralizing antibodies is not currently sanctioned by relevant medical societies. An additional challenge in initiating this program was that it was introduced at a time when Mayo Clinic, like other healthcare systems, concurrently faced the dual demands of dealing with a surge situation in the number of COVID-19 cases, and yet concomitantly was preparing for the implementation of vaccination programs. Razanable et al. described the infrastructure underpinning the success of this program, an infrastructure that includes not only the needed physical space and facilities where these antibodies are administered, but also an essential electronic network. This electronic network, relying on the electronic health record and informational technology, enables the following. First, the early identification of patients with newly diagnosed COVID-19 and meeting eligibility criteria to receive these antibodies. Second, assembling relevant electronic order sets. Third, establishing a registry for all eligible patients, including those who were infused and those who declined such infusions, and fourth, the ready communication among the diverse personnel involved in this program. The expertise and personnel needed for the success of the program are truly vast and include the COVID-19 frontline care team, experts from relevant medical specialties, nursing and pharmacy, primary care providers, infection prevention and control, healthcare administration, 
and experts in compliance, legal and ethical aspects, engineering, informatics, and facility management. The core monoclonal antibody treatment team serving as a hub that connects with relevant clinical and administrative expertise, established a just system for drug allocation that drew upon guidance from the FDA and relevant departments of health and human services and from ethicists and legal experts. The monoclonal antibody treatment team meets daily, reviews identified and referred patients and allocates medications according to patient eligibility and the consensus-driven process of allocation. This team engages relevant leaders and experts, not only intramurally within Mayo Clinic, but also extramurally. These Atlanta connections enable engagement with regional hospitals, long-term care facilities and nursing homes, and with providers caring for the underrepresented and disadvantaged populations. Between November 19, 2020 and February 19, 2021, this program at Mayo Clinic administered spike neutralizing monoclonal antibodies to more than 4,000 patients across Mayo Clinic's geographically diverse sites in Arizona, Florida, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Razanoble et al. point out that the preliminary results of this program are encouraging and that currently underway are analyses of such outcomes as rates of hospitalization, adverse drug effects, hospital free days, and mortality in patients in whom spike neutralizing monoclonal antibodies were administered. Razanoble and colleagues are to be commended for envisioning this paradigm for the delivery of anti spike monoclonal antibodies for eligible patients with COVID-19, for assembling a cohesive network of relevant experts and expertise, and for developing the requisite infrastructure and logistics that affect the essential processes of this promising program. Our first highlight this month contains two articles examining immune responses to SARS-CoV-2, the epidemiology, and the basis for a therapeutic strategy. The first is an original article entitled Prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 Antibodies in a Multi-State Academic Medical Center. It is authored by Dr. Ricky Carter from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and colleagues from Mayo Clinic in Arizona and Minnesota. And the second is a review entitled The Effect of Convalescent Plasma Therapy on mortality of patients with COVID-19, a systematic review and meta-analysis. It is authored by Dr. Stephen Klassen from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and colleagues from numerous national universities and institutions. These two articles in the present issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings examine different aspects of immune responses elicited by infection with SARS-CoV-2. Carter et al. assess the prevalence of antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 among healthcare personnel at Mayo Clinic, a medical center with clinical sites in five states. Between June 15, 2020 and August 8, 2020, almost 30,000 personnel were screened by a two-stage procedure that involved first a dried blood spot test obtained by finger stick which if reactive was followed by a confirmatory test based on a total antibody immunoassay on a venous blood sample. The overall seroprevalence rate was 0.60%. When analyses included all previous SARS-CoV-2 tests, such as previous serologies and RT-PCR tests, the prevalence rate was estimated at 1.08%. These findings are remarkable in that they are appreciably lower than what has been previously reported for other medical centers, the latter ranging from 3.8% to 13.7%. Such lower prevalence rates at Mayo Clinic sites may reflect several considerations, including the following two. First, prevalence rates for SARS-CoV-2 infection in communities surrounding the Mayo Clinic sites overall may be lower than elsewhere. Indeed, in the analysis by Carter et al., prevalence rates were generally higher 
at Mayo Clinic sites in Arizona and Florida, geographic regions with relatively higher numbers of COVID-19 cases. Second, precautionary measures against viral spread, including universal masking requirements for healthcare personnel, were consistently and promptly implemented at Mayo Clinic with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Also in this issue of Mayo Clinic proceedings is a study by Klassen et al that undertook a systematic review and meta-analysis of the current literature regarding the use of convalescent plasma as a therapeutic approach in COVID-19. Systemic antibody-based immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 in patients convalescing from COVID-19 are regarded as the effective mechanisms accounting for the putative salutary effects of convalescent plasma in COVID-19. This analysis by Klassen et al. included 10 randomized clinical trials, 20 match controlled studies, 96 case reports, case series, and two dose response studies. Based on their comprehensive analysis, Klassen et al. conclude that mortality rates were significantly lower in patients treated with convalescent plasma as compared with other treatments, especially so if patients were treated early in their illness with higher titer convalescent plasma. These two articles are notable for several reasons, including the fact that they are linked by the concept that understanding the response to disease and its causes can offer important insights regarding the disease itself and approach to therapy. The study by Klassen et al. demonstrates the beneficial effects that can clearly accrue from convalescent plasma, parenthetically, a therapeutic approach to disease that reaches back more than a century and was the basis for the award of a Nobel Prize to von Buring in 1901. The beneficial effects of convalescent plasma are more likely observed if convalescent plasma is administered in high titer and promptly after the onset of COVID-19. Our second highlight this month is an original article on peripheral arterial disease and the subsequent occurrence of atrial fibrillation and ischemic stroke. And this article is entitled, Lower Extremity Arterial Disease as a Predictor of Incident Atrial Fibrillation and Cardiovascular Events. It is authored by Dr. Andrew Thang from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and colleagues from Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, Arizona, and Florida. The risk of atrial fibrillation is increased by intrinsic heart disease, including ischemic, valvular, hypotensive, congenital, heart failure, and cardiomyopathies. By diseases elsewhere, such as pneumonia and sleep apnea. By systemic diseases, such as diabetes and chronic kidney disease, and by endocrinopathies such as hypothyroidism, and by such personal behaviors as smoking and excessive or binge alcohol intake. In the present issue of Mayo Clinic Proceedings, Zeng et al. examined whether patients with low extremity peripheral arterial disease are more likely to develop atrial fibrillation. In this large cohort retrospective study, Peripheral arterial disease was determined by the non-invasive test of ankle brachial index, abbreviated ABI, and representing the ratio of the highest ankle systolic blood pressure to the highest brachial systolic blood pressure, and the subsequent occurrence of atrial fibrillation assessed over a follow-up of 8.5 years. A low ankle brachial index reflects peripheral arterial disease that arises from atherosclerosis as atherosclerotic luminal narrowing lowers the ankle systolic blood pressure and thus the ankle brachial index. A high ankle brachial index reflects peripheral arterial disease caused by medial arterial calcification, the latter impairing vascular compliance and causing arteries to stiffen. Zeng et al. report that after adjusting for relevant comorbidities, and as compared with patients with a normal ankle brachial index, that is 1.0 to 1.39, 
patients who had an ankle brachial index either less than one or greater than or equal to, to 1.4 had an increased risk of incident atrial fibrillation. Moreover, as the ankle brachial index progressively decreased below 1.0, indicating worsening of peripheral arterial disease, the risk for atrial fibrillation increased. Such complications of atrial fibrillation as ischemic stroke, along with all-cause mortality, were both increased in patients with either a low or high ankle brachial index. While the basis for increased risk of atrial fibrillation in patients with peripheral arterial disease is uncertain, echocardiographic data in patients with an abnormal ankle brachial index in the study by Zhang et al. Of a possible explanation. In these patients, low and high ankle brachial index were associated with such echocardiographic findings as a higher left atrial volume index, left ventricular mass index, and a right ventricular systolic pressure, and a lower left ventricular ejection fraction. Notably, after appropriate adjustment, such alterations in these specific echocardiographic indices were also associated with an increased risk of incident atrial fibrillation. Thus, peripheral arterial disease, possibly through accompanying cardiac abnormalities, predisposes to atrial fibrillation, the latter through embolic events predisposing thereby to ischemic stroke. The study by Zhang et al. is an interesting example how disease may be relayed from region to region with such recruitment and amplification of disease processes in turn setting the stage for increased mortality. You can access these highlights and editor's choice articles free of charge during the entire month of May. When you visit our Mayo Clinic Proceedings website at www mailclinicproceedings.org. You will find links to our social media by clicking the buttons at the bottom of any page to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. On our YouTube channel, you'll find full-length author interviews called Insights, 60 Seconds, Video Article Synopses, and our Mail Clinic Proceedings Issue Summary and Author Insights podcast recordings which are available from our website on the homepage as well as through iTunes. You will also find our online only feature, Pioneers and Legends in Medicine, which are video interviews of people who've made a strong impact in their field of study. You will see many news stories at our website that are based on articles published in Mayo Clinic Proceedings. And finally, you will see other free content articles published online ahead of print. As always, we greatly thank you for your interest in and your support of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.